Hi everyone, this is Caroline Griffin. I am Riot's Event and Operations Manager. Thank you all for joining us today. I know that we have a, a few people still hopping on, but in the, um, out of respect for everyone's time, we will go ahead and get started. I'm really excited to have Michael Lout here today with us. He is the CEO of Lout Design, which is based in Raleigh, North Carolina. Lout Design has been a partner of ours for a number of years, and we're just really thrilled to have Mike here today to give us a virtual lunch and learn session. Um, for those of you who have attended his in-person sessions, they're just amazing and have a lot of positive feedback. So you're in for a real treat today. I will just give some really brief housekeeping rules. Um, if you have any questions, please do put those in either the Q&A or the chat box, and Mike and I will make sure that all of those questions get answered for you. This will be recorded and posted to Riot's YouTube channel and Meetup channel, so stay tuned um, for that. And um, if you do not see anyone else on the attendee list, that is to protect everyone's privacy. I assure you, you're not the only person here. We, we get that question a lot, but um, without further ado, I will hand it over to Mike. Um, enjoy. All right, thanks, Caroline. Um, first, just to make sure everybody can hear me okay. I guess, Caroline, can you hear me? Loud and clear, thanks, Mike. Okay, you bet. So uh, thanks for the, the very gracious intro. I've also got a few members of our team here uh, in person that are attending. So what I wanted to talk to everyone about today is what I call a cheat sheet on prototyping and manufacturing. So the idea here is that if you're developing something either from the ground up or you're improving on a product or you're thinking about an invention that you have or whatever, there's always kind of this fuzzy gray area when it comes time to like where the rubber hits the road and you have to make the thing. So we go through this process where there's a lot of sketching involved, a lot of conceptualization, uh, describing the form, thinking about what could be a lot of the ergonomics and things like that that go into what a product could be along with a ton of volume variation and ideas for com combining ideas and throwing out bad ones. And then we start getting more detailed. So while you don't necessarily have to be able to do uh, visuals like these or produce CAD models or anything like that, you still may have the question of, okay, now what do we do? How do we make this thing? Um, do I go talk with a manufacturer? Do I try to make this at home in my garage? And that's a question that we get quite a lot, uh, not necessarily in that forum, but it's more in the form of what do we do? We're stuck. We need guidance. And it's it's a big gray area. So there's there's a lot of different types of prototyping uh, that we do here. Some of them are really quick and dirty, and they're just about the general size that something could be, just to be able to get hands on, set it on the desk, see what you think. There's a lot of work in some different material combinations and some high-end stuff that uh, requires a lot of know-how and technical expertise to produce something that is made from the real world materials that the eventual manufactured thing would be made from. And the, the big advantage is there is that if it has to flex, it flexes like the real thing will, or if it weighs a certain amount, this prototype weighs exactly what your manufactured item might. And then we also get this question from time to time of, well, I'm going to a trade show and I need 10 of these things, or I've got a board and I want to be able to hand these out to uh, our board to get them excited, show them some progress. I'm launching a Kickstarter campaign and I need the first hundred of something. So we call that the awkward quantity. And what it's about is no manufacturer wants to talk to you about such a small run of something because there's no way they'd make any money doing it. But you may not know how to make these at home in your garage, or even if you do know how, uh, you may not be set up to do that in a high enough volume to hit whatever quantity it is you're looking for. So the work that we do is exactly set up for that purpose, to be able to make things that are either replicas of each other or perhaps there are slight variations. We use a lot of different technologies to do builds like this. So in, in under even if you're going to engage somebody who knows how to do this work to help you, an understanding of what they're doing and how to talk about it and uh, kind of what you're getting can be really valuable. And that comes in a bunch of different forms and on a bunch of different levels of detail, right down to aesthetic prototypes and things that are indiscernible from the real thing. We also get to do some really fun builds that are non-functional, just purely for the aesthetic, things like movie props for Hollywood industries. So what I find is when you learn about things like this, people use diagrams like this one, and they talk about the technical side with a lot of vagary, and they'll, they'll tell you some of the theory, but there's not a whole lot of practical transition of knowledge and this ends up happening to me 
which is also incidentally my favorite stock photo from the internet. So what I want to do today is break it down really, really simply into what, what a general idea of how to work with plastics, how to work with metals, and how to work with composites, what that looks like, what that is. And I'm, I'm planning on stopping in between each one of these sections um, to take questions as we go, so that way they don't pile up too, too large. So Caroline, if you wouldn't mind just kind of helping me if I breeze through, feel free to interrupt me um, if you're seeing questions come in. So, getting, yep, thank you. So, getting started on the plastic side, as you all know, there are plastics everywhere in our world, uh, for better or for worse, and in a, in a lot of cases, for better. And that's some of what you don't hear about. Uh, there's a lot of really utilitarian uh, uses for things like plastics. And then there's also another side to uh, their use and their formulations, their purposes, and things like medical devices, life saving equipment. So, uh, I don't want you to necessarily think plastic bad because uh, that's not always the case. So I'm going to go through a bunch of different processes of how people use plastics. And the first one that you've probably heard of is called injection molding. And I know that a lot of people know that name and they know the general idea of what it's about. But what I want to show you today is some of the like insider stuff that I personally have seen and have learned from a career in the design industry and also doing things like touring factories where things get made, watching parts we've designed get made, uh, receiving samples back from factories that do this work. So if you're not familiar at all, odds are good that there's something either in your pocket or within arm's reach in the room right now that's made via injection molding. And the idea is that we can nowadays take a 3D CAD model of geometry. We can create a mold and into that mold we'll inject heated plastic, <clears throat> typically under pressure. So it packs into the hollow cavity of that mold really tightly, fills in all the corners and the, the little crannies and everything, uh, and then when the mold opens, out pops this part. So what they do is they start with raw material called plastic resin, and there's a whole bunch of different formulations of resin, and what you're looking at here is what's called a homogenous mixture, where all of the plastic pellets that you see, which is kind of the raw form that this material comes in, uh, are all the same. Same general size, shape, color. They're very likely molecularly the same plastic. And there's a bunch of different plastics. And for the purposes of today, I don't want to get too deep into a lot of that technical uh, material science, but I want to just explain what happens uh, behind the scenes. So, as I said, you create a mold. It's also referred to as a tool or tooling. So, if you hear that terminology, that's kind of what you could expect. And it is often an A side and a B side. So we also have terminology called core and cavity. In other words, we have the part that fills in behind, if you can see my cursor here, behind this shape that you see here is metal that fills in to create this bulge outward. And then on this side, there's this cut inward. So you've got the core and you've got the cavity of this mold. There's a bunch of other features called locator pins, uh, things that help the mold align really carefully and very accurately when it closes. So to give you an idea of scale, which is one of the things that's always bugged me, I, I learn about uh, or hear about, even in school, some of the theory behind a lot of this manufacturing, but you often don't actually get to physically see that out in the wild. So this is a, an idea of scale here. This is an injection mold being lifted by a chain hoist. And as you could probably tell without even asking, this thing is extremely heavy. It's made from a solid block of steel. Sometimes they're made from aluminum. Uh, aluminum molds tend to not last as long. They're usually lower cost because uh, aluminum is easier to machine, and I'll get into that later. But in this case, it's steel. All the tubing that you're seeing on the outside, these are all either lines that deal with coolant. So it's typically blue is cold running in and red is hot running out. And the idea there is that the plastic that's being injected into this mold is extremely hot and it's under pressure. Uh, and when it flows into the mold, the faster it can cool down, the faster the mold can open and out pops your part. So you get from that what's called cycle time. So cycle time refers to how quickly can I make my widget or my part, and then how quickly can I get it out of the mold so I can start making the next one. And on a large scale uh, production, uh, like, for example, plastic forks are made via injection molding. And as you probably imagine, you want to make as many plastic forks as fast as you possibly can 
because there are a lot of people who want plastic forks in the world. So cycle time becomes extremely critical, has a lot to do with what that thing costs. So here's a little bit of a closer look. Here's a part inside of the mold that makes that part. In this case, it looks like some sort of screwdriver handle kind of thing. So what you can see here is called a runner. So this area right here, there's a, the injection port for the plastic itself, a runner that runs up to the shape of the part, and it flows throughout this whole cavity right down to the very end. And there's a bunch of other features happening here, but I don't want to get too complicated. That plastic flows in. Uh, it cools as quickly as they can get it to cool. And then the mold opens. So what typically happens is this runner gets cut off somewhere back behind here, and then pins pop this part out of where it sits in the mold. So that way the mold can close again and they can make another one of these. So again, to give you an idea of scale, there's a million things in the world that are made via injection molding, and they're not all small and highly detailed. Some of them are really big, like uh, plastic lawn chairs, for example, or car bumpers. And as you'd probably expect, uh, these are really expensive molds to make. And if you hear about injection molding tooling or tooling up for a build or for manufacturing, uh, you'll likely also hear about the cost. And the reason why is coming back to here and even here, really, molds like this can range anywhere from, I've seen them at around $5,000 to $500,000 on up to $3 million, depending on what it is people are making, how big it is, how complicated it is. Uh, a lot of it has also to do with what level of tolerance or how accurate the part needs to be that they're making. So when you get into the, the big world of industrial manufacturing and you get into molds that are more on a scale like what you see here, uh, these molds very, very easily get up into the millions. And, and part of the reason for that is if you look at that block of metal, uh, in this case, I actually do think this is an aluminum mold, but even a block of aluminum that's big enough to make something like that, that actual block of metal itself may be up into the tens, even hundreds of thousands of dollars. Then you've got to carve out in metal the shape twice that you want to make, the core, which is over here on the left, and the cavity on the right. And depending on how accurate this thing needs to be, uh, you've got to be really careful, really pr precision-based when you do that. Then you think about one of the big costs here, you have to move that thing. And as you'd imagine, this thing weighs more than, uh, if this was a, this is not a car part, I think this is actually part of a septic tank. Um, it weighs more than, in this case, this bumper weighs more than the car sitting next to it, uh, the mold for this bumper, I should say. So molds that get up into this big industrial scale that make parts that look like this, uh, they get extremely expensive. And you can kind of see behind here in this picture an idea of the scale of the machine or the, the injection molding machine that holds the mold that makes a part like this one. In this case, all the engineers can fit inside of it. So this goes on up in scale uh, to almost like a cartoon level of huge, where these molds become these massive things where they have to open up the side of the building to get them in. And as you'd expect to, these are likely molds that don't change often. This machine may only ever make that part just because of how big and expensive the setup is for something like that. So what's happening inside this machine, which isn't always that big, and I'll get into that, you have what's called a feed hopper. So all those little blue pellets that I showed you before, they all get dumped in uh, either by an automatic feed if you're making a lot of something or by a human with a bucket. They get poured in, this auger or the screw turns and it shoves little pockets of this material on forward. And while they're being shoved forward, you have these little heaters. In this case, it's a cross section, but these would wrap around the cylinder and they would heat this plastic hotter and hotter and hotter as it makes its way from this hopper over to where it's injected into the mold, which is where the name comes from. So usually what happens, is because this area is large and because it shrinks down to something small and the screw keeps on turning because this motor back here is very powerful, it builds up a lot of pressure in this area, which is important because it takes a lot of pressure, a lot of force to shove plastic uh, that doesn't really want to flow into a mold. And the more I heat it, the longer it takes to cool. So if I can heat it just enough to flow in properly and make my part, 
it means that I can make the next part really fast. So it flows into the mold when the mold is closed. It gets cut off right about here where my cursor is. And then the mold opens after the parts had a chance to cool. So down in that, what, I'm, what I'm, we're looking at here is the mold itself. There's a bunch of different components that you don't really need to know about, but you can kind of see here where the plastic flows in, then it starts to form the part on both sides in this case. And there's a bunch of different terminologies and things for the different components of these molds that you don't necessarily need to know. But in, in the end, the simpler the part, the simpler the mold, the smaller the part, the lower cost the mold, although those two uh, can vary based on other factors. Big machines like this that need a ton of volume and also a ton of heat and also a ton of pressure, they also mean that the process of making your part is probably going to be very expensive. But nowadays, this is starting to change a little bit. Uh, injection molding machines are getting actually a lot smaller, a lot more efficient. They're designed better. They look better like this thing does. Right down to desktop versions, where if I'm just making something really simple, and that's all I need to make for quite some time, um, maybe I'm not really intent on running a high cycle time. And maybe I can cool the mold down. You can see here where there's like a CPU fan just sort of bolted on that just blows on this thing to cool your part down. Uh, you can do this via desktop uh, injection molding, which is becoming more and more of a thing. And if your part is simple and you don't need hundreds of thousands of them, uh, that might actually be really practical. And in this case, you can see your mold sitting or the cavity side of the mold sitting right here. There's a bunch of different design requirements that come along with designing parts that have to be injection molded. And this is kind of where uh, engaging an expert comes in, uh, where you'd think, okay, I've got this drawing, I just wanna make that, or I've even got a CAD model, why can't we just mold that part? There's a lot of stuff that has to be figured out in order for a part like this to be made. So you can see here that there's in, inside the part, uh, in this, this part's case, a ton of what we call ribs. So these serve a bunch of different uh, a bunch of different purposes. Some of them might be, I need to be able to hold internal components. In this case, maybe there's like tubing that goes throughout here. Um, I need to be able to accept screws with what are called bosses, these little towers that you see sticking out. Uh, from the other side of this part, so this part split right down the middle, I have two halves. When I put them together, a screw might go inside of each one of these things. I've got this little lip that runs around the whole outside, and that's kind of designed to engage a pocket on the other part of this assembly. There's a bunch of rules around how you design things like this, not just so they function, but also so they mechanically fit together properly uh, when that plastic cools, just like any material on, on Earth. When it cools, it shrinks. So if the mold is really warm from the part before it, the plastic is really hot because it's has to be heated in order to flow and it's under high pressure when the part cools and the whole thing shrinks down what we're trying to achieve at in the end is the part geometry we want so you actually make your mold a little bit bigger than the part itself and there's as you'd expect a whole a whole science a whole area of study devoted to things like that and then there's also some errors you can get where plastic doesn't fill in uh, you get what are called voids, or as it cools, it shrinks. And because it's also shrinking up into a rib like this, on the back side, you get what's called sink or like a dent. So you can kind of see here, there's a bunch of little tiny things that you'll notice on parts that are not made very well. And I, I won't get into too much detail, but imperfections in the surface. Here's an example of sink marks here. Any, any plastic bin like this, you find you're going to find sink marks. And there are some things in our world where it's like, who cares? You make the mold lower cost, you make the parts stronger, and you just don't care about stuff like this. Um, but then there's also a lot of things where the cosmetics of the part matter quite a bit. Uh, or if you're not careful, you're, you'll get errors like this that make the part unusable. All right, so pausing there real quick. Um, maybe if we have any questions, Caroline, maybe you can hit me with like two or three of them. Absolutely. Um, the first one here is, is there an inclusive chart of additive Oh, excuse me, someone just typed something so it rolled down. Is there an inclusive chart of additive and subtractive prototype technologies with advantages slash disadvantages summary with unit cost estimates? And are there many and which of those would you recommend? That is a hell of a question. Um, <laughs> so in terms of a resource to go look up what these things are, 
uh, I can maybe follow up with some things that are online resources. There's some really good books on things like this, but that's such a big, ugly question in the form of a lot of different answers. And the, the worst answer of all, which is the one that I'm going to give is it depends. So it depends heavily on what you're making, what it's made from, what shape it is, what features it has, uh, whether it's a cosmetic part, if it has to endure stress, thermal, uh, if it's exposed to fluids or ultraviolet radiation, and on and on and on. So there's no simple answer to that, but uh, there, there are probably some great resources that maybe we can send out afterward. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, the next question that we have here is, how do we reduce the cost of creating a mold and what cost should we expect? Yeah, so there's no way to um, say what cost you should expect, but in terms of how to uh, reduce the cost of the mold, some of that is just designing a part in a smart way. And then another thing to think about is maybe your part actually gets more complicated, but because it's more complicated, it serves the purpose that multiple parts used to serve. And that's advantageous for a few reasons. One is I'm making fewer parts, so I need fewer molds, which is obviously going to save time and money. You don't have hardware, and I don't have to pay for hardware. And I also don't have to pay for a human or a robot to assemble it. So there's a lot of, I'll say, like cleverness in designing parts that are multi-purpose. And the best way to learn about how that works is to take things apart. So if you've got an old DVD player or you've got a... Uh, I don't know, electronics are a really good place to find plastic enclosures that have a lot of that going on. Just take, take that garbage and turn it into something useful, learn from it, take it apart. While you're in there, you might even be able to fix it. Um, so beyond that, if you're not gonna become an engineer, go to engineering school, you're not gonna get into the design field, then that's who you'd wanna talk to about uh, an investment upfront and in, in saving part cost later I pretty much could say literally always pays off by a factor of, I mean, 10, 100, 1,000. Uh, you could imagine that pulling the trigger on paying for a $500,000 mold, you want to make sure that what you just did is right and the part that's coming out is going to be correct on the first try. So there's a lot of a lot of time and energy that goes into the front end of that. That's helpful. Thanks, Mike. We'll take one more question right now. Um, do we need to provide you the CADs or do you offer that service? You don't have to have that. Um, we typically start with sometimes nothing, a verbal description of what you're trying to do. Uh, sometimes it's a napkin sketch, uh, just a very rough idea. I've seen people harvest a laptop hinge and cut apart a Rubbermaid bin and come in with a prototype they made at home. Uh, we also work with people who have CAD abilities, even on a small level and things like SketchUp or Onshape or one of the um, free CAD packages. Or if you have a really detailed model, that's cool too. Uh, and we do just prototyping work. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. So the next one is extrusion. And this one's kind of interesting because there's, just like the rest of these things, kind of an art to designing for it. What's going on here is not that different where you've got a hopper or like a, a funnel that gets filled with plastic resin. It goes through an auger or a screw, just like what you see here. It gets shoved down into a smaller shape, and then it gets forced through what's called a die. And you can think of a die kind of like a mold. And if you've ever played with Play-Doh, uh, putting it through one of those little things where you like squeeze out noodles, that's extrusion. In this case, it's running through a bath where it gets cooled. So it's all heated. Uh, this orange uh, part here it gets cooled down, so it's stable. And then on this side, extrusion is called a continuous process in the sense that people who do extrusion are usually running these machines constantly and you don't stop. They run 24 hour shifts. And at the end, they're either taking a continuous, like a fiber, a strand, um, or like a ribbon of something, and they're putting it on a big industrial roll and they're, they're cutting it very infrequently. Or maybe your part uh, gets cut really frequently. For example, if you're extruding foam, to make a foam roller for like yoga or exercise, uh, you would extrude maybe three feet of this foam noodle and then you'd cut it and now you've got your part and you keep extruding and you cut it again. So you make things like this uh, via extrusion and they can have what's called a profile or a shape to the end of this part. And you'll see a lot of times there's internal ribs and things that help make the part stronger. In a case like this yellow part over here, you might have these T-slots where you could slide hardware down in the end and attach this to something else. 
uh, if you've ever worked with PVC pipe uh, or walked through Lowe's and seen things like pipe made in metals, uh, plastics, whatever, those are usually made via extrusion, not always, but uh, especially in the world of plastics, they're typically extruded. And then there's pasta, uh, which if you're grasping for exactly what's happening with extrusion, next time you're eating pasta, take a good look at it and think about, oh, that's how that's made. It's forced through an opening. And what's really fun with this example is there's a blade on a spinning core where as these noodles are forced through a die, they're given their shape, this thing spins around and it just basically shaves them off of that surface. And you can see the ones over here are shorter than the ones that are just about to get cut. Uh, so pasta is made via extrusion. That's a good way to remember how extrusion works. Any questions based on that one? That one's a little smaller. Not at this time, Mike. Okay, great. All right, so then you have blow molding. And blow molding is another thing where I guarantee that if you go home and you are looking for this kind of thing, you're going to find all kinds of stuff that's made via blow molding. And what's happening here is we're, we're starting with a hollow tube of plastic that's either extruded down from above, usually using gravity to help. And it, it, drops, it drops down from something that looks a lot like that pasta machine down into uh, a mold that has a cavity on either side. In this case, we're starting, instead of a big hollow noodle, we're starting with something that looks kind of like a test tube. And the reason for that in this case, because we're making a bottle and a bottle needs threads for the cap to screw on, this part, this blue part you see here is actually injection molded first. So you start with this little test tube looking part, you insert a straw, you start filling it with air and you blow it up like a balloon. It expands into the container around it and it takes the shape of the inner walls of whatever that mold is. So in this case, we uh, our outcome looks like this bottle with the ridges in it. And just like anything else, there's a lot of strategy for how you design parts for blow molding because these ribs are the reason that this doesn't just collapse when you squeeze it. Or the elimination of things like those ribs mean that uh, you could produce something like a squeeze bottle that's supposed to be squeezed. So a bunch of everyday items that are made via blow molding. This gas can, for example, starts with a big red hollow noodle that's floppy because it's heated. It drops down into a mold that closes around it. A straw is inserted and it's blown up like blowing a bubble chewing gum or something. And it expands into the, the mold that gives it shape. In this case, you usually have to come in and trim out areas like the handle. Um, you might have to do some cleanup. And what's interesting about this example, and if you go look at something like a gas can, you can see the seam that runs right here. Um, that's where the two halves of the mold come together. And the reason that there's a seam there is this, this plastic often gets pinched imperfectly and you get what's called flashing or like the squished edge of this hollow part. And you've got to come back and trim off that flashing later to make a part that's clean. They also do some really interesting things with blow molding. So one of the things that we run into is people think that you only make bottles with it. And that's definitely not true. If you look around your house, there's a lot of, um, I mean, Rubbermaid, for example, is a brand that does a ton of injection or a blow molding rather. So you can make whole products via blow molding. And you'll notice that it tends to be a lot of like lower cost plastic stuff. And it's usually also very big, uh, not always, but you can see the seam here on the fork of this bicycle uh, or like big wheel bike uh, where the two halves of the mold came together. They add ribs to strengthen areas that endure a lot of stress. Even the front wheel and the back wheel uh, are both blow molded. And the way that you can tell something that's blow molded is it's hollow. And in some cases, not only is it hollow, it's totally uh, sealed. So if you're making something like a liquid tank or whatever, um, blow molding is a really good way to get a nice seamless outer wall. Parts that are made via blow molding also typically cost very little uh, in volume. That depends on their physical size, but the mold itself, coming back to here really quickly, while this mold isn't terribly um, low cost, it's much lower cost than something like an injection mold, which has a much higher level of precision associated with it. Where We don't really care what's happening on the inside of this part because you don't interact with that. It's not a mechanical interference or anything. Um, so anyway, that's an example of blow molding there. And one of your most everyday objects, uh, like bottles made out of uh, PET, which is a type of plastic, 
um, which is very highly recyclable. Uh, they give them things like ribs to make them a little bit stronger so you can hold on to them without them collapsing. And this started from that test tube, just like I showed you, where uh, we have a threaded upper area with a flange on it. And half the reason for that flange is so it can go into this blow mold later. Any questions there? We did have a question. Um, can blow molding be used for cheaper quality metal products? Sort of. Uh, there's a there's a way to start with extremely thin metal uh, and inflate it, believe it or not. They don't always do it pneumatically with air. You can actually do it with liquid. Uh, and there are a few things in the world that are made that way. One of the ones that comes to mind, and they're not always this way and haven't always been that way, but if you've ever seen those metal canteens that they use in the army, basically like drinking bottles, uh, they're formed in a kind of a kidney shape in a way that's kind of designed to like hug your body a little better so they're not such a bulky item. Some of those are made via hydroforming where they start with a blank. They pressurize the inside all at one time with a ton of pressure. Uh, and it basically expands that metal really instantaneously out into fill a cavity. So you wouldn't refer to that as blow molding, but it's a very similar process. And yes, those are low cost parts. Thanks, Mike. Um, mm -hmm. Next question, how do you ensure uniformity of the thickness with complex shapes? So it kind of depends on the geometry of what they're being squished by. Uh, if you've got this noodle being extruded and the walls of that, that hollow shape are all the same, which they usually are, the die that makes that hollow shape has a uniform wall thickness. When you inflate that part, you're inflating the same thickness of plastic into all different areas of the mold. So it's pretty typical that a blow molded part like that has the same wall thickness throughout, unless it's in an area that's being pinched. And in some cases on purpose, like you could, in fact, let me go back to this bike. You might do things like pinch in an area to create a rib where this rib actually might end up thicker because the two walls collide together and they kind of get formed into the same thicker wall. Um, so you do see that a little bit, uh, but in general, it's usually the same wall thickness throughout. Got it. Thank you. And one more question here. How does working with plastic work in the detail making parts that snap fit? So typically, if you're looking for a snap fit, uh, and in case you're not familiar, it's exactly what it sounds like, where two halves come together without hardware, and there's clips um, or features that allow them to kind of clip or click together. Uh, those are typically made via injection molding because you need that level of detail and you need a solid part to be able to make features like that. That's not always true. You can do, in fact, you can do blow molded parts. You can do thermoform parts. In fact, the example that you see here, um, you think about something like a disposable food package and the lid that snaps into place. That's kind of like a snap fit. Um, of a different kind, that creates, without getting too technical, what's called an undercut in your mold. Uh, in other words, a part of the mold where the part itself gets in the way of the mold being able to open. And that's the kind of thing that makes your part more expensive. However, if it means that you don't need multiple parts, you don't need hardware, and you don't need assembly, then an expensive individual part might make your overall assembly a lot lower cost. So there's kind of a balancing act there. Okay, great. Um, so thermoforming, the idea here is we're taking a heated sheet of plastic. Thickness can vary, but it's usually fairly thin. You heat it often from a bunch of heated coils above it, kind of like what you have in your oven. And then once it's hot enough to be floppy, it usually does what's called slumping, where it sags down. And then as it heats more, it tightens up like, the, like a drum, and then it's ready to be thermoformed. This frame drops down, as you see here, and it drapes this part over top of a form like this. In this particular example, you can see that they're drawing a vacuum. Um, so they're sucking air down from underneath to pull the part tight to the mold. And you do that when you need this thermoform part to be really accurate. So it's not just food containers and disposable stuff that's made this way. There's a lot of things in the world that get um, thermoformed. 
It's really typical that trays, uh, reservoirs, buckets, there's big industrial pallets and things that are made via thermoforming. Um, this is a really, really low cost way to make plastic parts. So if you can use thermoforming, um, you typically always will, uh, both because it's low cost. You can also get really nice looking parts. The surfaces are typically really easy to control as long as you're starting with a like a quality sheet of plastic to begin with. Thermoforming is also a fairly quick cycle time. It does have a couple of downsides. One of them, as you can see in this part, I have to clamp this sheet of plastic in order to make this part here. And if this isn't part of my part itself, I've got to come back and trim off uh, the edge. So in this case, this almost certainly was larger and then they have to come back and trim off the edges. So there's a little bit of like post-process work. One of the cool things about thermoforming is as you think about it, if I'm making this tray over and over again, the next tray that I make fits into this one. And by definition, the geometry nests together. So it's pretty typical that thermoformed parts stack together. And if you think about like a Starbucks coffee cup lid, that's an example of a thermoformed part. And you better believe that those stack together in the high quantities they make them in. If they didn't stack together, kind of like a solo cup does, um, it would cost a ton to ship a bunch of like hollow air in between those parts. They also use this on a much larger scale to make, in my opinion, one of the ugliest parts ever made, which is this tire cover on the back of a RAV4. They just like threw a slash in here because they didn't know what else to do, I suppose. But you can make big cosmetic parts like this via thermoforming as well. So it's not just for um, like thin, cheap, disposable. Um, you can also make other parts that way. Any questions about thermoforming? Not right now. Thanks, Mike. Okay, great. Okay. So another one is roto molding. And you, as you can see here, these molds are really big. Uh, they're really ugly on the outside. They're typically, it's unimportant what's happening on the outside. The inside, however, is really carefully controlled. So you might come take a bucket of plastic resin, dump it in, close the mold, and then it goes into a fixture like this one. And what's happening here is this rack rocks back and forth like a seesaw, or sometimes it just sits here and spins. While that's spinning, this barrel rolls. So if you imagine being inside of this thing as both of those actions are happening, you're just getting tumbled around um, like one of those NASA training things. So if you've, got, if you've got plastic resin in here and you can see these jets down below are heating what's inside, if you make this into a liquid and then you start tumbling this mold, all that liquid is going to start sloshing around on the inside you can do this kind of DIY version of that. And we have one of these actually in our shop too, where you can make small molds and roto mold. Uh, what we're doing is using a power drill to activate a series of gears that rotates a frame inside of a frame. So you get biaxial rotation and can slosh liquids around inside of a mold until they harden. And then this happens on an industrial scale too, where you know big machines like this, they spin, they tumble, they roll, and they kind of just, again, slosh plastic around inside of them or urethanes or other materials until they're cold. And then you open the mold and out pops a hollow part. So it's not so different than blow molding in the sense that your part is a hollow thing. You've basically formed a bubble. But the advantage to roto molding is that you can um, start with a smaller quantity of plastic. You don't have to deal with flash. Um, these are typically big hollow parts, like big tanks. And I think that's a septic tank there. Uh, if you've ever sat in a kayak, there's a good probability that that was roto molded. Uh, and if you ever used a cooler, um, especially a Yeti style cooler like this, uh, they are made via roto molding. And then in this case, because the part is hollow, if you look really carefully on the bottom, and sometimes they'll cover them up with the feet, there's a little drilled hole where they spray foam inside those two hollow walls to give it rigidity. OK, any questions about that? No questions right now. Thank you. OK, great. Um, so shifting gears to metals. And we're going to go through this a little quicker because some of these are a little easier to understand. So we have what's called machining. And what's going on here, and that I kind of hate that term because it's a general term that also refers to some specific processes, but uh, we're using a spinning cutter and we're crashing it into a block of metal. And if you do that in a really careful and controlled way, 
you can form a part by cutting away metal. It's a subtractive process where we start with a solid block and we remove parts. So what you're seeing on the left here is your, uh, your I was going to say your run of the mill mill. Uh, it's called a milling machine. And all that's happening, there's a motor up at the top. There's a gearbox that either speeds up or slows down. You've got, this is called the Z-axis that moves up and down. And it's got a cutter, like what you see on the right-hand side here. This is typically called an end mill. That gets put into this end, kind of like a drill bit uh, would go into a, a drill press. But the difference between this and a drill press, although you can treat it like a drill press, is that there's a table down here. And when I turn these knobs uh, either here or on the front, this table moves left and right and in and out. I've also got what's called a knee down here where I can turn this crank and this whole bottom section goes up and down. So I have like a rough Z axis using this big crank and then a finer Z axis using something like this wheel. And if I spin a cutter like this and I mount material on the deck, I can remove that material uh, so kind of like drilling in and then moving around left and right. So I've got in this example, this is acrylic, which is actually a plastic, but I just wanted to mention that there's lots of machining that's done in other materials besides metals, lots of milling operations as they're called to make parts like what you see there. And what's happening on a small scale is this spiral sharpened uh, cutter is crashing into this material as it spins and it's removing what are called chips. And there's a whole bunch of calculations and a lot of careful figuring out of what's called chip load based on what kind of cutter you're using, how aggressive it is, how sharp it is, what it's made from, what material you're cutting, how deep you've sunk into it, how fast you're moving. Uh, so anyway, there's, there's kind of an art to this, especially when it comes to making really precision parts. So you can see here uh, a cutter moving along this wall. And as you'd guess, uh, trying to make a part like this using hand cranks, which coming back to this mill, is for a long time in the world, especially in this country, how things were made. Nowadays, you have what's called CNC milling or CNC machining, which stands for computer numerical control. And what's happening there is instead of a human turning those dials, you have motors that turn those dials that are very carefully controlled via computer logic and they move this machine around in a predetermined set of paths. So tell me where to be X, Y, and Z, and how fast to go there is basically what's going on. And it allows you to make really complicated parts that would be really hard to make by hand, and in some cases, impossible to make by hand. So what's going on here is the same idea where you have a spinning cutter from above, but then your part, instead of being mounted on a deck that goes left, right, in, and out, this does go left, right, in, and out. It also rotates in this direction, and it also rotates in this direction. So you have what's called a five-axis mill, where your part can move around under this cutter, and it allows you to make extremely complicated things that you couldn't make any other way. Here's another picture of that here. This milling machine, which, as you'd guess, is extremely expensive, also has what's called an automatic tool changer or a turret. So I'll use a bunch of different cutters based on what I'm doing and what level of detail I need to hold. For example, this big gnarly thing down here is designed to just remove material as fast as possible and start coming down in scale based on detail. And then another thing you're seeing around here are these little orange nozzles. These either blast air at the part to keep the part cold or they'll blast cutting fluid at the part. Um, it's basically like a lubricant so the cutter stays sharp and things don't heat up. So another piece of machining, uh, as the general term refers to, is called turning. And you turn apart on what's called a lathe, like what you see here. You would put your raw material inside of this chuck. In this case, it's a three-jaw chuck. And you would crash this turret with a cutter on it into that part. And as it spins, you remove material radially. In this case, they're removing material from the outside, and then they're also drilling into the inside. So this is likely on a CNC lathe or a computer-controlled lathe that makes parts like these round, spun-looking objects that are um, based on like a central core spinning around. Uh, it's also how they make threaded screws, um, any kind of knobs or fasteners. It's, there's a good chance that like your kitchen knobs are made this way, pulleys, gears, all sorts of things. Any questions there? Yes, we have two. 
The first one is how does the cutter mill compare with the water ablation or other tools which remove chips by erosion with impact? Sure. So some of those uh, processes, there's a lot of different ones that do what you're describing. They'll use electrical charge uh, and saline water to eat away or erode a material, like you said. Those don't involve anything that spins. And the big advantage to those processes, which are kind of tough to explain in words, but easier to see happen, is because there's no spinning cutter, you're not reliant on this thin little needle of a cutter to do fine detail. That cutter would often break and they, they break all the time. You can do extremely high levels of tolerance. You can machine some materials that are almost impossible to cut with an end mill because they heat up too fast. Um, you can, they use them for surgical parts, implants, dental, things like that. Like if you have a titanium part in your spine or something, there's a good chance it was made via a process like that. So. The two are related, but not the same. Uh, and as you'd expect from that description, parts that are made via that erosion or EDM type process are extremely expensive. Uh, they end up in Rolls Royce aircraft engines and uh, turbines and things like that. Wow. Thanks, Mike. The next mm -hmm. question is, how do we use this information to create designs and prototypes for our client with production in mind? How do we estimate and who do we contact? Uh, I'll give you my phone number at the end of this presentation is the easiest answer. Um, while we can't do everything all the time, that's pretty much what we, um, that's what we do here. So we're a good resource for that. Uh, engineering firms typically uh, analyze parts and optimize them for production, like you know, all of these processes really. Um, in terms of how to design parts, that's that's a big, very complicated question. It depends on what you're making, and there's a lot of criteria there. Uh, so, yeah, contact an expert is probably not the answer you're looking for, but that's probably the best answer. Thanks, Mike. And we'll make sure everyone has your contact information at the end. We do have one more question okay. here. Does NC State have a course where one can get a sample of hands-on manufacturing techniques? Yes, um, anybody who's gone through their mechanical engineering department surely has taken those classes. Industrial design, which is my background, uh, there's a lot of that kind of thing. Um, there's also some other options around here. Wake Tech does a lot of this kind of thing, uh, machinist classes. Um, so short answer, yes, lots of resources around. And you're in one of the best cities in the best state, in the best country in the world to learn stuff like this. I agree with that statement. Thanks, Mike. So next up is casting, and this one's really easy, or at least mostly easy. Uh, as you can see here, you take heated molten whatever. It could be lead, pewter, steel, aluminum, copper, zinc, uh, any, any metal, any plastic, uh, any really anything that you can melt down to a liquid. Uh, and Casting has been around for centuries. Uh, they use it to make coins, uh, medallion type stuff, jewelry, uh, all kinds of things. So they also use it to make much more complicated objects via different methods of casting. And if you're unfamiliar, this is an engine block. So the core of what uh, is going on under the hood of your car. As in this example, they're just pouring onto the surface. So an artisan would sculpt the first of this coin They'd make a mold based on that, that form, and then you can pour all this liquid metal um, into that mold to replicate over and over again. In this case, you use a process called sand casting. And what's going on here, this is kind of a crazy thing where they make the positive. So you'd, you'd machine a part like this, uh, you'd, you'd mill, mill it by hand, you'd sculpt it, whatever the case is, it doesn't really matter how you make it. And then you make a mold made of sand uh, around that. And the idea is that there's geometry in here and there are parts that are like impossible little nooks and crannies and uh, hollow areas that run throughout for coolant and whatever, uh, but you can't make any other way. So basically what happens is you pour molten metal into a mold like this one, and then you destroy the mold. And the reason that the mold is made of sand is you want the mold to crumble because if it doesn't, you'd never be able to get those parts of the mold from out out from inside of your part. So there's an example here, of like the core made of what's called green sand, where this goes inside of a larger outer mold. It has end caps like what you see here where the water pump would mount. 
that goes all put together in this big, very strange looking object. And then they pour molten steel onto the inside. They let it cool, let it harden. And then they whack this with a hammer and this green sand crumbles to dust and you're left with a part like this. So another example of that uh, casting process here, um, you look at a shape like this poured into a receiving mold and then with post-process machining, you can get a part that looks like that. So casting is often used for really flowing organic surfaces, really elegant parts like this. And in some cases, uh, really the only way to make a part like that. So cast aluminum, cast steel, cast iron. Uh, there's a lot of different metal processes and then uh, as well, as I mentioned, a lot of cast plastics. So some of these are related. Um, so I'm gonna keep moving through this one. Um, there's also a process called forging. And in the old world, uh, blacksmiths used to use exactly what you see here, an anvil, hot metal, and a hammer. And they would just beat this metal to death until they had the shape that they wanted. On an industrial scale, forging looks something more like this. And it's something that we've, we've uh, really been able to enjoy watching things like this happen. I can tell you that in places that do forging, you cannot believe the amount of force behind a forging hammer like this one. And you can tell from the size that it's, it's pretty serious business. You wouldn't want your fingers under that thing. Uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds of force all exerted at the same time onto a hot piece of metal that shoves it down into a mold to make a part like this. And I personally have had the luxury of walking through the channel lock factory where they make pliers, uh, taking a round dowel of steel or a steel rod. And with enough force, uh, you can shove that down into a mold so hard that that metal changes shape into a part like these two parts of this plier. The big advantage to forging metal is it's unbelievably strong when it's, when it's done. And if you've ever used a pair of pliers like this, um, they're pretty tough to break. They're made to take a lot of abuse. So what goes on is you've got your workpiece or your raw material. You've got a ram or a ton of pressure behind two halves of a mold. They come together and they squish this down uh, into the shape you want. You usually have what's called flashing. And the idea there is you want enough metal in here to make sure you make your whole part. And if you don't, if you don't have a little extra, it sometimes doesn't fill out. So then this rises back up. You've got your part with these little wings on it and you shave off those wings. So that's used to make parts like wrenches. Uh, you can see the die or the mold that makes this wrench here. Out of the mold would pop something like this. This just sort of like squished metal form. It would be the same as if you were to squish like Play-Doh in here or clay. Uh, and then you, you trim off that flashing and you're left with a wrench. And there's a bunch of post processes like machining the faces to be flat. Uh, if you want them to be really accurate, you could polish them to be smooth and shiny, coat them in chrome, uh, a bunch of things that happen with things like wrenches. So any questions so far there? No, we're good. Thanks, Mike. Okay, great. So bending, uh, as you'd expect, not too, not a lot of rocket science here. Uh, take a flat sheet of metal, bend it into shape. But the art form here is adding features like this. This is called a gusset, and it bridges this shape and this shape, where if this weren't here, it would be too easy to unbend what they've done. But because this is here, uh, it it makes this all very rigid. So sometimes what happens is you bend your part and then you do what's called stamping it, which is a lot like forging to put in features like this. So they make all kinds of things this way. Um, everything from like outdoor candle holders to sheet metal enclosures on industrial equipment. Uh, underneath your car, there's probably bent metal components and bracketry. Uh, this is a mouse trap that's made out of just bent sheet metal. So there's a lot you can do with it. And again, these are typically pretty low cost parts. You can also bend tubing and you've got some specialized equipment that does that. Where taking a hollow tube and bending it without crushing it uh, is pretty difficult. If you look at um, things like a chain link fence gate, uh, if you, you have like a rounded corner, you can sometimes see where cheap parts like that, where the cosmetics don't matter, sometimes they get crushed because you just don't really care that much. Uh, there's other ways to bend metal using what's called a mandrel that stays in it uh, and keeps it totally hollow uh, and keeps the walls from crushing down. Another trick is you can take this tube, you can fill it with sand, 
So that way, when you bend it, the sand won't let the outer tubing crush or pinch. Uh, you can also fill it with water, oil. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do that. And people use that process to make things like roll cages, um, furniture, all sorts of stuff. And related to that sort of is what's called roll forming. So I'll start with a flat sheet of metal and I'll roll it through two rollers that can crush it, they can bend it, shape it. And this is another good way to make really strong parts that are linearly or dimensionally very stable. And you can kind of see here how like the molecular structure gets crushed down and packed together. Um, I could take a thin ribbon of sheet metal, put it through rollers and reshape what that ribbon is. Um, or rollers that look like this. There's also progressive rollers where like one of them will start the shape, the next one's a little different, the next one's a little different. So this ribbon runs through a process and gradually takes on a much more complicated shape. Any questions there? We're good, thank you. Okay, and we're getting tight on time, so we'll breeze through this, but then you have composites. So fiberglass is a pretty typical one. It's made of layers of fabric, uh, made up of glass fibers. And they're formed into a mold, kind of like what you see at the bottom right here. It's how they make hot tubs, in-ground pools, everything from ladders to furniture, aircraft. The big advantage to fiberglass is it's really lightweight and it's really stiff. Once you form something that way, uh, it does not want to change shape. So you coat that fabric in epoxy resin, basically a glue that hardens extremely stiff. When it hardens, uh, it does not want to let those fibers move. So you see fiberglass parts made for race cars, uh, aircraft, like I mentioned, spacecraft even. Uh, you can get really organic shapes. Uh, one of the fun things about fiberglass is you can drape it over anything. So uh, if I carve something out of cheap foam or I model it out of clay, um, I could lay fiberglass over top of it, make my part. And another cool thing about fiberglass is it's extremely heat resistant. So if I capture a bunch of clay inside of a fiberglass mold, after I'm done, I can heat that part and I can let the clay drain out of it, uh, or I can melt the foam inside of it. Or in some cases, you even burn the material out of it. So if I made a mold out of wood and I made a fiberglass part that I wanted to be hollow, um, I could light it on fire because fiberglass doesn't burn. So they use this to make all kinds of stuff from Porsches to Corvettes to um, Cessnas, all kinds of big parts. It's really uh, economical to make things that are large in a way that injection molding could never be. So there's a reason that they make boat holes out of fiberglass. The other big advantage for things like boats is fiberglass doesn't rot or delaminate uh, if it's done properly. Basically the trick is get all the air out and have nothing but glue or, or epoxy resin. There's also polyester resins and other things um, and the glass fiber itself. So it's extremely rigid. Related to that and made almost as exactly the same way as carbon fiber. So the big advantage here, carbon fiber is five times stronger than steel, twice as stiff and way lighter. So what this material uh, is all about is the strength to weight ratio. So there's a reason that you see it in a lot of performance products like outdoor equipment, bicycle frames, racing seats, again, spacecraft, all kinds of stuff. Um, and it's made the same way, carbon fiber fabric, woven like what you see here, and you can kind of see like the frayed edge, laid up into a mold uh, or spun around a form. That's how they make pressure tanks. You can get uh, fiberglass or carbon fiber tanks for scuba diving or industrial equipment. Um, that's how they make a lot of hollow parts. It's how high-end automobiles, like for example, the uh, I used to work with a company that used to make the intakes for McLaren. Um, all the really fancy carbon fiber parts under the hood that weigh very little. Or you can lay it up just like fiberglass where you use epoxy resin and sometimes just a really cheap paintbrush because you're going to ruin the brush and just kind of dab epoxy resin all over the place until it's totally wetted down, takes the shape of what's underneath it. This is the um, engine cowling, I want to say for Maserati. So. It's not a super like fancy looking process. It's actually very dirty, but by the time you're done and you trim off this edge, uh, what you're left with is actually quite beautiful. So they'll use hollow tubes laid up in molds like what you see here, uh, heat them up to activate the resin to make things like bicycle frames. 
uh, or hollow tubes like this. And the reason that carbon fiber is so expensive is that the actual carbon filament itself is difficult to make and expensive. There's an art to weaving it. And the epoxy resin you need to do carbon fiber is also often expensive depending on your performance. So in general, there's an the art variety will kill that noise. There's an art to making things that it requires a ton of equipment and a ton of know-how. And that's kind of what our shop is built to do. So if any of you have any questions, there's all my info there. Um, I'll be happy to answer the ones that I can. And I appreciate your time today. 201, not too bad. Thanks, Mike. We, we did have one follow-up question um, from based on the Caroline, previous anything, uh, Any last minute stuff to wrap up? Yeah, just um, one question. Based on the previous question about comparison charts, do you have a favorite book and or bookshelf of manufacturing technology which would go into the level of description of the manufacturing tech? There's a book from 1940 something that I have called Machine Shop Practice. And if you can get your hands on that, which is probably going to be difficult, that's like the, the Bible when it comes to running equipment, like what we have in our shop here. There's a million other books about um, materials and processes. That's kind of the category that you'd want to look for. So if you were to go on Amazon and search for that, um, there's a book called Process. Just one word. It's called Process. It's got a blue cover. I really like that one. And the way that book is laid out is they take a product, and these are in, like, from what I can tell, no particular order, and they walk you through exactly how it's made. So screenshots of sketches and things that went into the development, uh, images of the CAD models that uh, created it, um, the molds that produce it. Uh, and then I even think that book has links in it where if you wanna go online, you can watch videos of those things being made. And it just goes through all different types of stuff. It's very cool. Really helpful. Thanks, Mike. And again, yep. Mike's contact information is right here on the screen. We'll be sure to share that on the Meetup page. Um, that is all for the questions I'm seeing, Mike. So thank you so much for being with us today. Um, for everyone that is wondering and has asked, this will be posted to Riot's Meetup page. So please stay tuned for that. Um, thanks again, Mike. We really appreciate you being here today. You bet. Thanks for the time. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.